I'm glad to be here. Thanks uh, for inviting me out here, Mr. Mandel, and the Pine School. Uh, it's been a great day. It's, TED is just a really cool experience where, you know, in the same day you can have a classical opera singer, you know, sing you Journey and have a math professor run like a madman across the stage. So it's just a really cool experience. Um, I am a teacher. I'm glad that, uh, I was glad to see Becky Bailey. Um, I'm a former kindergarten and second grade teacher, so I don't know if there's any elementary teachers out there. Um, but what she says makes a lot of sense. Uh, hopefully your brain is still activated. I'm going to be talking to you today about digital footprints and how we need to have our students be uh, taking this opportunity on in school so that they can give some better opportunities for themselves down the line. Before I get started, I want to make sure that we are clear on the term digital footprint, what that's all about. Uh, digital footprint are just the trails that we leave behind on the internet, uh, whether it's something that posted by us or about us. And I've heard it called lots of different things, even some things today. I've heard it called digital presence, a digital trail. Earlier today, someone called it a digital tattoo. Um, but I really like this, foot, this footprint analogy. And the reason I like it is because the symbolism that it brings with it. If you think about footprints on a, in sand like this, when you come across footprints, you can get an idea of where someone has been. You can get an idea of who they've been with. You can get an idea of what they've been doing. And you get an idea of the direction that they're headed. But what's really powerful for students is uh, about this analogy is that these footprints can change path. You know, even if there's been something negative done online in the past, we can always forge ahead in a new direction with our students. I think that's a very powerful analogy that we need to use with our students. Because we've all done dumb things in the past. Let's face it, I mean, I know I've done, you know, my share of dumb things in, my pa in the past. My dad's out there, some things I've told him, some things I haven't. Um, and in the interest of full disclosure, I just want to share with you, in case you go out and Google the digital footprints guy and try to dig up any dirt on me, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm just going to show it out there and put it out there, the two most incriminating pictures of me that you can find on the internet. And here they are. Shield your eyes. Um, there I am, band geek and uh, dad geek. Um, and now, of course, the point is here, you know, those of us that are over 30, 32, I'm 35, those of us over 30 and 32, we don't have our dumb years or, our, you know, hopefully primarily, primarily our youth uh, captured online. And that's something to understand that students do have to deal with. Now, what I did uh, last week, I had Mr. Mandel send out a survey, and I sent out the survey myself to all the teachers in Cabarrus County, North Carolina, which is where I'm from. And it was just a simple one-question survey. All I did was ask, what words pop into your head when you think about students posting information to the internet? And thank you all, uh, if you're in the audience, the staff members of Pine School for responding. I got over 250 responses. And what I did was I took those responses and I put them into a word cloud, which is just a visual representation of text. It lets you analyze text. And I want to show you what that image looks like. These are the perceptions that we have of our students posting online. Uh, what you see in the word cloud, the bigger the word, the more frequent the response. So you can see a lot of negative perception here right off the bat. Dangerous, scary, uh, bullying, inappropriate, uh, trouble. There's someone out there, I don't know if they're sitting here tonight, there's one in there, it's real small, it's uh-oh, uh, which I love that response, uh-oh. Um, but what I'm going to do today is I'm going to challenge you as educators and members of your community to completely flip this perception around. Because when I think of students posting online to the internet, I think of opportunity. And I hope to take you there with me today. So for the next 10 minutes, um, I'm going to give you two big, re two big reasons why we need to have students publishing and posting online in school. I'm going to follow that up. I'm a practical guy, so I'm going to give you three reasons of how you can start doing this in your schools next week. At the very end, I'm going to close by showing the big picture and how this all fits together. So let me go ahead and get started. Um, our students have new first impressions uh, by their digital footprint. You know, back in the good old days, six or seven years ago, uh, our first impressions were contained in resumes, applications, cover letters. Um, that's not necessarily the case anymore. Employers and university registrars are checking out our students online before they hire them or before they accept them to college. This is our new reality. I found a really cool poll a couple years ago by Harris Interactive. And the poll was asking employers, how many of you check out a candidate online before you decide to hire? And they did the poll in June 2008, and that number was 22%. They redid the poll again in June 2009, just one year later, and that number almost more than doubled to 45%. Uh, 
Now they discontinued that poll, but I can feel pretty confident that if they hadn't, these numbers are discontinuing to rise. Our children are graduating into an environment where they're being checked out online before they're being hired. That is their new reality. Um, and so one other thing that was really cool about that poll is not only did it ask employers if they checked out candidates online, but it also asked them, you know, if you saw someone online and you, it was a candidate for your position and you really wanted them, you saw their presence, you saw what they were doing online, you said, I want to hire that person. What were the things that you saw online that they were doing that made you want to hire them? And these were the top responses. Uh, the candidate was being creative online. The candidate was showing good communication skills. The candidate was, had a good personality and showing that off online. And so what we need to think about in education is we need to think about how can we be doing this stuff in school to better prepare our kids? How can we encourage these things in school so that they're prepared for this new reality? So that's the first big reason why. The next big reason why we need to do this is because of the opportunities that present themselves um, online for our students. I don't know if you know who these two are. I've lost our students. I feel like it's bare out there as far as students go. Um, but you guys know the guy on the left, right? Who is it? Justin Bieber. Justin Bieber. Thank you, the Biebs. Um, yes, Justin Bieber, a Canadian uh, boy a couple years ago, 12, 13 years old. His mom decided uh, to videotape him while he's singing at various gigs and post those videos to YouTube so his family and friends could see. You know, you can almost imagine the, uh, the conversation in the Bieber house. You know, Mom, you know, why are you posting this stuff? No one cares. Um, but of course, we know the rest of the story. Justin Bieber, uh, his videos were uh, seen by a record producer, found that he would be very marketable. Now he's a multi-megastar. The other guy you probably don't know up here, uh, this is Robert Ney. And Robert Ney is an eighth grader, a 14-year-old in Utah. Robert Ney had a very big year last year. He decided he wanted to create an iPhone app, a game, a physics game called Bubble Ball. And Robert Ney decided he was going to do this, and so what did he do? He got some books on how to create apps. Um, his parents bought him a MacBook, and they supported him in that. And he went ahead and he created this game, and he released it to the Apple App Store. Within two weeks of it being released, it had been downloaded over two million times. To date, it's been downloaded over nine million times. This one kid, this eighth grader in Utah, took down Angry Birds as the top-selling iPhone game. Anyone else out there, Angry Bird addicts? <laughs> uh, so Robert Ney, and what's, what's interesting about these kids is these kids are not all that uncommon. There are kids doing amazing, powerful things. If I had another hour, we could tell story upon story of kids doing amazing things online. But what do they all have in common, other than being, uh, you know, half my age or less, what they all mostly have in column, common is that they're exclusively doing these things outside of school. They're taking advantage of these opportunities outside of school. And I think that's a shame. Um, I think we need to bring these opportunities in our schools and let our kids expose our kids to these opportunities so they can have these kind of opportunities in school. And especially our kids that don't have the resources or support at home to be taking advantage of these opportunities. What about those kids? So that's my second big reason of why we need to do, be doing this in school, is the opportunities themselves are incredible and they are very important. Now I just want to give you three uh, kind of ways how we can move forward next week. And the ways that I'm going to give you, these are not sequential steps. These are things we can all be doing at the same time. The first thing we need to look at is we need to look at our school's filtering policies. Can students even access the tools they need to take advantage of these opportunities? Can they do blogs? Can they do wikis? Can they do Facebook? Can they do YouTube? Can they access Twitter? Can they even access these things on our school networks? Now, I'm going to tell you a dirty little secret about school filters and school networks, and I, I'm kind of glad that the kids left for this one because I feel like I'm ratting them out. Um, but the dirty little secret is that the school filters are already down. Um, I don't know if you know that or not. Uh, I'm just going to show you this image. This is straight from my own Facebook stream. I, as I said, I used to teach kindergarten and second grade, so I've reconnected with some of these kids. and They're now juniors and seniors in high school. By the way, if you want to feel old, uh, teach a kindergartner and then watch them graduate. Uh, but anyway, um, when I come home and I check my Facebook statuses, 
I'm seeing my, my former students posting online during school all day long. How are they doing this? The students, if I see any out here, they probably know how they're doing this. Uh, anyone know? Their phones, exactly, that's right. With the spread of 3G and 4G wireless networks, smartphones becoming cheaper and cheaper, our students are walking through our doors with unfiltered access points in their pockets. Now, if they're already posting online, doesn't it make sense to be proactive? Doesn't it make sense to open this up and become transparent? Doesn't it make sense to teach responsible use rather than hiding it away in a book bag or a locker or a pocket? Now, once we take these filters and we kind of open things up for our students in school, are there going to be problems? Are there going to be misuse? Absolutely. There will be. As a parent of two young girls, I understand that fear. But I would much rather have those mistakes happen openly and transparently in an, a caring environment with supportive, caring adults. And so I think we need to bit take a look at that filter policy. Now, once we have those things in school and we're working on getting those things opened up, what do we want kids to be doing? I would encourage you not to teach digital footprints or not to teach digital citizenship, but rather immerse students in the task of publishing online. If you think back to your school years, you probably, uh, if you think about something that really stuck with you, something that was really meaningful, it was probably not what was being taught that day. Our very first speaker today um, was talking about something that was impactful for her, a project that she did you know, over 30 years ago that still stuck with her. That's how most real learning happens. I happen to have a copy of one of these such projects of my own. This is from my senior year of high school. I'm going to let it play. It's really kind of ridiculous, and I can take the award for the worst video shown at TED today. Um, but this was a task that was given to me by my physics teacher in high school, Mr. Mannion, circa 1994. And I found this in my attic about a month and a half ago. I was looking for baby stuff. We got a third one on the way. Woohoo! Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I can procreate. Um, but what, a, what this project was, our physics teacher basically gave us three rules. He said, get into groups, and this is terrible, by the way. <laughs> he said, get into groups, create a physics video, and then share it with the class. Now, what my group came up with, with this terrible example you're seeing, we did the Star Wars versus the WWF, OK? <laughs> the World Wrestling Federation. We see that WWF's kind of taking control there. But I'll be the first to admit, I did not learn a lot of physics when I made this video in high school. I really didn't. But what did I learn? I learned about video editing. I learned about overlaying audio. I learned about perspective and lighting. You know, uh, I learned about planning and storyboarding. And it's things like this that I never would have touched had I not been assigned this task and immersed in this task. And it's things that I use to this day. <laughs> Go Luke. Oh, I'm sorry about the blood, by the way. Uh, kind of a nasty end to the uh, world WWF. Um, <laughs> But I take these things with me today. I create video tutorials for teachers about how to use digital tools. And I use these skills even to this day with something that really stuck with me. So when I, when I say this, I make sure that you want to know, don't teach this, but rather immerse them in that task. The next thing I, would make, I always encourage is what are they actually doing? What are students actually using? What kind of tools should they be using? I always encourage students and teachers to use digital tools to collaborate, to create, and to publish. And to do that in that environment of flexible problem solving, where kids are immersed in a task, and they're making mistakes, and they're attacking things from multiple angles, and finding multiple solutions. And these are just some tools that you can use in your classroom next week, or push in your community next week. Um, I'll just go through a couple of them. Some collaboration tools, like ePals, a great way to connect with students across the globe. Google Docs is a great collaboration tool. Skype, get experts into your classroom. Uh, good creation tools, just some samples, Animoto for video, Glogster does posters, create a class YouTube account and post video. And publication tools, of course, we're publishing just about everything. I encourage that, uh, publishing online with just about everything we do. But when I talk about publishing, I want you to encourage kids and start developing digital portfolios, which is kind of like a traditional portfolio, except it's online. So you're taking all of these ideas and all these things that they've created online, and you're having students choose what can represent them, something that shows growth or proficiency, something they reflect on and grow from. And that's, that's something that they can then take with them outside of school, so that whenever they go to those places, 
um, where the employers are checking them out online, they can say, hey, please do, check me out. Here's my website, here's what I've been doing. And it's something that can really give them that edge. Now, at the beginning of my talk, I told you I would finish and show you the big picture of, all this puts, of all, how this is all put together. So I'm going to go ahead and show that to you now. This is a terrible pun, but there it is, the big picture. That it all fits together inside the big picture. Um, but <laughs> I know, it's terrible. It's late, I know. I, those are sympathy laughs, I get it. Um, <laughs> but uh, this big picture, I do want to take some meaning from this, and I do want to close with this. Uh, this is a Monet. It's one of those classic Monet landscapes. And if you think about it, um, we can't tell where Monet laid those very first brush strokes. We can't tell what mistakes he made and had to brush over. We see the finished piece of art. And I think that's exactly where we are, we are with our students right now. Our students are putting their very first brush strokes on their digital canvas, on their digital lives. We have this incredible opportunity as educators to help them create something that's beautiful to share with the world. And I think as educators, it's our duty to make this happen.